Okay. <laughs> so, um, Devin, um, <laughs> thank you for uh, being our mystery um, speaker uh, today. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> And um, I'm really excited to start this conversation with you. Um, I, I feel like you have so much to share. So I'll, um, I've, I have a few questions, but I'll just maybe start with one or two. And I, I want everyone else to be able to um, connect with you. Um, and so my first question is, um, I think everyone on the call knows that you're currently living in Oroville with your family, um, and you've been there um, a year. Um, but before that, uh, you were in Bombay, um, and I think sometimes in between Bombay and Ahmedabad um, at the Gandhi Ashram. Goa. Yeah. Goa. And so my question is, um, can you start by talking about the question um, you started to ask yourself a few years back? Um, and how that inquiry, you know, how that inquiry led you to Oroville. Like, so what did you start, you know, asking yourself in the life you were living um, a few years back? Hey, uh, thank you, first of all, for having me on this call. Uh, I think uh, the, the call that we had before, in like the pre-call, you know, was itself very enriching, you know made me think so uh, it's a pleasure to be on this call uh, i think for me as uh, i think annabelle said you know this has been a process and uh, i don't know where to put like a point when something shifted in a big way but if i were to put one point i think uh, post 2010 you know when i kind of started doing vipassana meditation and really getting you know deep within uh, there were always these questions. So I think, you know, there is, you know, this whole spiritual view and then there is a material view or, you know, inner and outer. So personally for me, since uh, pretty early age, these, these, you know, two, you know, worldviews were always, and there were always these you know, conflicts uh, that were coming up from time to time. But I think around 2010, you know, shifted deeply. Where really when I started going within uh, and asking these deeper questions, of uh, like as you know, when fast says you know what is life you know are you just here to come do and go or is there you know a larger purpose and i think in that uh, and there there itself you know in, in buddha's teaching this whole thing of right livelihood you know came and uh, so on one side i was doing these things like just today uh, my wife my daughter and i we came back from a vipassana center where there was a one day children's course where my wife and i served and uh, you know our daughter sat for it and while you're coming back we felt that like this is this is the best work that we think we can do you know uh, to plant seeds in children uh, so, so we were doing you know such work whether it's vipassana whether it's service space so there was this this work that we were finding so enriching that we want to really that was you know helping us grow and it's for like a service to the world and then there was some other work which you did which kind of paid the bills and uh, and you know around after 2010 it reached a point where it just didn't make sense to to have this dual thing that i do something else which is uh, i do for you know money and then there's something else so i think uh, that was the primary question which kept you know coming and through the journey uh, we are where we are i i was also you know going through a presentation i met I made at service space uh, one of the retreats in 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 India in Andhapath where the title was uh, Labor of Love uh, Weds Live Right Livelihood. So you know, uh, so that was the point where another you know big thing happened and this whole startup service you know initiative was born with the same you know thing. And I think uh, I have seen things unfold as the inner deep, you know inquiry deepens and you kind of do the effort for your inner purification and cultivation the outer things, you know, keep shifting. You start meeting people, uh, you know, and things start happening. And then one thing led to another. And here I am in Auroville with family. And I really feel very privileged because I think I've shared earlier that here, it's our, our intention is that work is not a way to earn livelihood. Work is a way to express oneself, to develop, you know, one's capacities and to be in service 
to you know the community and humanity as a whole and in that process the community takes care of our living needs so it's not so much of i working for my livelihood or my family's livelihood but you know i just offer myself completely in whatever ways is enriching to me and is in service to the community and the community takes care of me so it's a beautiful uh, space to be in but i think it was this 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 inner inquiry and to keep you know digging you know keep keep you know going deeper and deeper is what i think it's been and it, and now that everything is sorted because or will there's an ideal there's an intention and then there's also practical reality there is you know we are a lot of you know, beauty has emerged but there is a you know long way to go so yeah i think that is in 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 nutshell the answer to your question thank you ravan um that's actually a good segue to my next question um because you were saying that there's i want to make sure i'm not muted um there's the reality of oraville and then there's the ideal um of of what it was founded on and so it, during our initial conversation you had shared with me um a, a, in a book you read a conversation between the mother and sri aurobindo and um it was about immediate achievement and um can you share about that conversation and also your own reflections on immediate achievement and um how you what the work you've been doing to stay connected to your true intentions so there's multiple mm-hmm. questions in my question but yeah yeah i think uh, what i was referring to in that conversation was uh, an incident that happened i think last month i was at uh, vinoba ashram vinoba is this uh, you know gandhi spiritual successor so i was there meeting some of the uh you know uh, disciples of vinoba who are now in the 80s and 90s there and they kind of picked one you know one book of sri aurobindo and mother uh, where uh, you know mother tells sri aurobindo that uh, she was in a certain higher state of consciousness and uh, she kind of had a deeper you know communion with the with the gods and and then she comes back in her you know Uh, waking consciousness and she tells shorabindo that this is what i saw and this is what can be done and shorabindo told her that uh, that's good i think uh, if you do what you said uh, you will become very famous uh, you will you know get a lot of disciples and you will also do certain things to shift you know uh, several systems but he said that is still in the realm of mind and uh, our real work in uh in our, in our yoga is actually to go beyond mind and bring this you know what he calls supramental consciousness again these are all uh, you know terms which i'm not sure everyone here would you know relate but essentially what he was saying that uh, if really one needs to achieve whatever is whatever you feel is your highest intention then in that journey you have to let go of smaller successes which you know which may be which may be which may seem that oh this is also a good thing to do but then you will always get caught into those things which are nice to have but then you will not do what is meant to be your highest intention what is meant to be your highest work so i think uh, and and then i come back to oroville and i i pick up a news weekly newsletter that comes and that same story was there in in even oroville's weekly newsletter so for me it was like you know, the signals came from both you know sides of you know about whom i really respect a lot and also you know sri aurobindo that uh, like really what is what is your highest work and then do what needs to be done to live that highest intention and don't get bogged down in something which you know is just immediate and may thing may seem a nice thing to do so that's uh, what was i was referring to yeah i want to open it up for um other questions um that are popping up in people's minds as you're listening to Devin um share thank you are you uh, you are on mute it looks like fash has raised his hand okay thank you so much devan for what you shared 
So my question, I mean, based on the last thing you said, well, um, as a matter of fact, Aura really is somewhere I want to visit, so <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> okay, so my question is, you as a person, what is, for example, your highest goal? So uh, for me, last uh, three, four years, this one quote, which has been said by many people in different words, but it, uh, Raman Marshi said it in, in the way that uh, it's uh, your own self-realization is the highest service you can offer to humanity is what he has said. And, you know, many, uh, so for me, this has been, you know, one deep inquiry that uh, as in what service play that we say, you know, change yourself, change the world. So to me, uh, self-realization, you know, is, is the highest goal. And uh, I also kind of, because I was, you know, going deep into Vipassana and, and, you know, Buddha's teaching and all, there was a time where I kind of found myself withdrawing from what is called the outer world. You know, I was going deep, doing inner work, and I felt I was kind of withdrawing. And in some sense, when I came in contact with Sri Aurobindo's teaching and mother and then coming to Auroville, uh, it this whole balance of inner outer kind of came together that how do you really in everyday life so you know the term we use here in Auroville is all life is yoga so if yoga is union with the divine and uh, it's not just you know the exercise you do just a physical body but you know it's so then all life like in every task that I do right from, from where I wake up in the morning till even sleep you know even in Sri Aurobindo Interior Yoga, there's a way to sleep, you know, which is also, uh, so, so he kind of really inspires you to live your life in that spirit. So for me, I think right now, uh, since the last one that I'm here, I'm really closely looking at each aspect of my life and I'm saying, okay, how can this be done in a way that it's being done for the divine? And that also includes money because I come from a background of working in the finance, you know, tech, you know, world before I got into this whole work of service. So uh, after coming to Auroville in the last one year, I think I have taken again the work of finance and money, but in this light, you know, the conversation that I was referring to earlier, that why is there, you know, so much money available for someone who wants to build, you know, some app sitting in Silicon Valley or, uh, but if somebody, you know, in Auroville here, wants to really, you know, take a piece of barren land and convert it into a green forest, uh, there isn't even money, enough money for some of them to kind of, you know, do that. So why is there such a huge mismatch and how have we reached? So in the last one year, I've been engaging with, you know, my work with finance money to really uh, create that new kind of uh, financial institution. We are working on a prototype project that we are calling as Mother's Bank here, you know, uh, that... Uh, what if there was, you know, a financial institution which dealt with money in a more conscious way and people who really want to live life in this period of inner transformation, how can money flow to them in the conscious? So, uh, so money, I think, uh, by, by its nature was created out of separative consciousness, you know, because I, I feel that I am separate from you. you know, I need money to transact. And that's, that's how, you know, money is created. And, and in, in the design of money, there is scarcity, there is competition, the way it's structured, you know, it's debt-based. So, uh, so that's the reality of money as it is. But uh, if we kind of want to rise in consciousness, if we want to more and more, uh, you know, believe that, no, we are one and we care for each other. So how do you shift consciousness, you know, of money from the separative consciousness to a consciousness of, you know, love and oneness is the question we are holding. And what if there was a financial institution which really kind of started with that intention and allows the flow of you know money with this consciousness is what uh, also we are taking up as a as my work here in Norway. Hmm. Are you are you muted? Oh, there you are. Yeah. So I. I've got a question. Um, to me, what you're saying about um, uh, money and, and you know, your, your questions you're holding about money, given your background, Devin, is really fascinating. And I'm, 
I'm curious a little bit about the earlier part of your career. How did you get into uh, working in finance, you know, and how did you decide that that was not sufficient? Yeah, yeah. So I think for me, I started my career when I was 17, still in college. Uh, you know, my dad passed away, you know, suddenly. And then there was this situation where I just felt that I want to kind of, you know, support at least my own expenses. So I would kind of go to college in the morning and then afternoon I would go to work. And finance just happened accidentally just because my sister's friend, you know, uh, you know took me as, you know, as an intern to work with him. Uh, so that's how it started, not out of choice, but just because there was someone who I knew who was willing to take a 17 year old, you know, boy, uh, you know, uh, to work. And that's where it began. And I think uh, I worked for about three years, uh, you know, made good money, but was completely feeling, you know, empty from within. And uh, all the, all like, you know, I, I grew up in a family where tooth and nonviolence were the two, you know, main pillars of of our, you know, uh, growing up and to see how in the financial world that is compromised on an everyday <laughs> basis was completely, you know, I couldn't take it. So I think I just kind of, you know, uh, quit that and I moved on to tech. So at that time, internet was just coming up. This was, you know, the uh, early to mid 90s. And then I was fascinated by internet and I took it to software and I kind of spent three, four years there. But that was still again in the realm of business and hence while I was growing from the traditional parameters of, you know, uh, promotion and salaries and all that, this emptiness, you know, as I said earlier, the, this, this conflicts between what your spiritual worldview tells you and what the business, you know, remained. So it was around 2002 when it was very clear to me, I was 25 then, that uh, this world of business is not for me. I really need to uh, look at the non-profit sector and, you know, doing something more meaningful. 2002 is when I made that shift. I started working for a nonprofit in the area of technology and media uh, for social good. And uh, that was also enriching at that point. But then it reached its limit that, oh, it was too impact focused. Then I need to do something which is leading within a transformation. And then that those paths led to service space and, and others. So that's how the journey has been. And, and it incidentally just so happened that while I didn't want to work in finance, but finance ended up coming into my life again and again. So in, even in my four decades in tech, I ended up working for banks or, you know, creating software for financial institutions. And I was in this nonprofit. I ended up creating investor education content for the financial world. So somehow it kept, you know, coming back for me, even though I didn't want to engage in that. And same you know, in Auroville. Uh, I am now working on Mother's Bank, you know, which is... Uh, <laughs> To do with money so then I kind of realized that yeah, there was a reason why it came like now this work that I'm doing with money is feeling I'm feeling very enriched because uh, it is not I am doing for just myself or my family but it's I'm we are seeing it as a larger problem for humanity and if even something small can be done to shift something there it can create new pathways so yeah that's how the journey has been. What a beautiful model of a uh of the dynamics of, of a right livelihood journey. Uh, thank mm. you. So who else has a question? Annabelle. You're muted, Annabelle. There you go. Okay. So one of the things that struck me when you were talking was that there seems to be an ideal of mutualism where um, you take care of your community and your community takes care of you. And I'm wondering, what do you think are the patterns, uh, habitual patterns of behavior or the challenges to the, the full accomplishment of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think what I have realized for me personally, and this has happened over and over again, is that uh, the more I kind of focus on my inner work and, you know, building this resiliency equanimity that comes from inner work and not so much from outer circumstances, I have seen things, you know, uh, so, so whatever are the 
the fears or doubts, they're all at the level of my own mind. And when I am able to overcome them, uh, I just see, and just to give an example, like this one year that I'm living in Auroville, uh, we're supposed to be self-supporting. So uh, I was doing this consulting work you know, with uh, a finance, you know, company and when i chose to come to auroville i told them that uh, you know i'll be quitting because i'm coming here and i want to give all my time there and i did not have uh, much idea of how i will you know manage and this company with whom i was working for four years you know the founders you know were typical it was a business you know uh, firm but i had good relationship with them uh, but this founder he's not particularly spiritual in fact he's an atheist he doesn't even you know believe that there's God or whatever, but something shifted in, in this conversation when I was sharing with him what I intend to do at Auroville. And he said that uh, for a year, you know, you don't need to worry for this year, first year in Auroville, I'll continue paying you. You know, if you have time, you do work, just be available to us to answer questions. And that kind of, you know, renewed faith in me that community, like I may think of service space as my community or my family as my community and Auroville is my community. But when you really offer yourself in that spirit, support will come from, you know, even, you know, places that, so then in the whole humanity is a community. So it, in this case, it came from here. So I think uh, to me, I have seen it's directly proportional. Whenever things have, let's say, not worked in the traditional sense that support has not come, I see the source of it is in my own, you know, lack in inner cultivation. So... Uh, so that is what uh, I have come to realize that I think uh, ultimately it is how much am I committed or each one of us are committed. And and as you know, Nipun says several times that if sometimes if suffering has to come, the material suffering, then that is also what we needed at that time to grow in our inner work. So, so this I think I'm realizing more and more, especially in the last one year in Auroville of how when I just offer myself uh, then support comes from really uh, different ways mm. <laughs> uh. Oh, go ahead, Ari. You... I just want to ask if anyone else has a question at this point. Who else? In the meantime, as people are maybe coming up with other questions, um, Devin, I wanted this also to be an op. We wanted this to be an opportunity for you to. Um, sh uh, be able to talk about or you know put out there any inquiry that you're holding any question that you would like to be supported around so something maybe that hasn't come up yet in the conversation um, that you want to talk about um, yeah. mm -hmm. I think as when I was reflecting on this and this work that we are doing around, you know, money and all, one thing that is coming up at that this thing of right livelihood is really so, so much of a personal, you know, uh, thing. So uh, like in, in India, historically, you know, if you see of you know, people who have achieved self-realization, there is such a wide, you know, range. There is, you know, Gandhi's spiritual teacher was Srimad Rachandra was a businessman he would do business by the day of, of diamonds and, and then you know he would write and he would you know wow. uh, write a letter to gandhi you know there is uh, you know king, king, king janak you know who was like a king but you know by being a king he still you know became fully realized there was kabir saint who was a weaver and then there are people like mahavir and you know siddharth who left kingdom so so there is the white wide mix and i think uh, uh, to kind of uh, like, I think in the last last call also we share that sometimes this thing of right and wrong can also be just our own mind level, you know, uh, judgments that we make. So if whatever work I'm doing, if it is taking me closer to my highest intention, then that is right livelihood. And if you know if it is not, then that is not. So uh, that mm. one reflection came while we were having this circle with five, six of us. 
mm-hmm. on this topic. Thank you for that. That makes me think of, you know, something you shared during our initial conversation was that sometimes when you feel that things are not in alignment, um, you know, in the outside world, something you come back to is the writings of the mother. Um, and that brings you back to um, the right intentions. And so I was wondering if you could share about certain um, particular writings from her um, that have really inspired you or ones that you're reflecting on of recent? Mm. Yeah, I think that was a conversation more in terms of specific to Auroville, like Mm -hmm. Auroville has a current reality today, uh, so that is ideal. And then, uh, you know, you may see that in some areas, the reality is quite different. And uh, then, you know, I kind of you know feel oh you know uh, but then in those moments of doubt if I just open so there's a book called Mother on Auroville where it's all all that she's written on Auroville has been compiled and I if I just read a few pages of them then I kind of it takes me to a, a different level to say okay you know uh, and and there she so so she speaks about that uh, when someone asked her that you know uh, who created Auroville. And uh, she says that uh, there are some things that humans create and if the divine agrees, then they happen. And if the divine doesn't agree, then they don't happen. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that divine itself creates and then that has to happen. You know, it will happen despite. So she says Auroville will become what it has to be despite Aurovillians, you know. Uh, so, so she really, you know, speaks from a very uh, different state of consciousness when she uh, really thought of Auroville. And, uh, and uh, for me to, you know, just whenever there are moments of, you know, doubt <laughs> or when I see conflict, when I just, even whether I read or if I just, you know, go in silence and I connect to what that intention is, and then there's just so much of gratitude I feel just to be part of this beautiful experiment. And, and that I'm here. So, uh, so I think uh, for me, this word divine, you know, in some sense was just a word before coming here. Mm. Uh, uh, but I think uh, being here in Auroville, I think it is much more a personal experience, you know, now. And uh, so no specific writings, but I think every time I, you know, open Sri Aurobindo's or Mother's work, you know, that is what, you know, connects me, you know, to that, that. Yeah, all life is yoga and uh, it, is, it is not for, even like if they say that, you know, even when you talk of service, you know, it's not really about serving the needy or what. You serve the divine, you know, whatever is meant to be your, you know, path. Uh, uh, so it's, it's you and the divine. Everything, you know, here in Auroville or in Shab, that they, all your work, all your outer work, if it is taking you closer to that, you know, whatever words you use, whether it's self-realization, whether it's union the divine, then that is the right work. And if it is not taking you there, it may sound very, you know, grand in terms of service to the humanity and all that. Mm. But then underlying that can be the same games of ego and, you know, power play and all that. So, uh, so I think they really, their writings really, you know, put me back to that, that, you know, is this work really taking me? Uh, more and more in connection with the divine or whatever that, you know, larger force that you may want to call different names. Uh, so that is what their writings really connect me back to. Mm. Charles, I has a question. Yes. Hi. So, um, you know, Oroville is really interesting in that it's a, an experiment in human unity. The notion that this dream that the mother had, and she wrote a, a 1954, literally a, a vision, a dream, a dream of the divine consciousness that will be, of what, um, that there needs to be a place where these things can manifest, and the very things that you're, you're talking about, uh, living in Oroville, that human beings would learn to have their um, means of expression and then the community take care of you. Um, so I think Oroville is like a really special place to sort of test and rub of uh, the ego and our 
the what we experience in most of the world and to try to live in this other um, consciousness or to rise to that. Um, what, what I'm interested in is in, since you've been, um, Devin, in both worlds, you know, since I'm living, you know, I've done work in Oroville, but then I've also, I do work on the outside. Um, and, you know, the notion of which a lot of times in integral yoga isn't emphasized is of swabhava, so, you know, the highest being, swadharma, the highest role of the individual in the complexity of everything that is. When you're not living in the experiment where everyone agrees to come together and do that, finding in you inwardly, spiritually, not just general realization, but your own particular highest purpose. Um, that's not about ambition. It's not about ego. It's not about, you know, struggle and all that, but there is something that is deep within you that's your own individual uh, part in the symphony, right? And actually, Sri Aurobindo and the Mother do talk about this, um, not so much in the context of Oroville, but in more in the yogic terms. And I was wondering, like, in your, in your own um, journey of this, like, where have you come with this notion of our highest purpose um, individually? not just in the collectivity, but for your own individual resonance of Swabhava, Swadharma, or that sort of thing? Oh, beautiful, beautiful question again. Okay. And uh, which is where I think this, uh, this quote that uh, I referred a few minutes ago, that it is uh, your own self-realization that is the highest service you can give to humanity, no matter where you are on this planet. And it took me a few years actually to really, you know, understand this thing because there is, when you see that, oh, you know, there is so much the world needs, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, one can go and serve. Like Sri Aurobindo himself, you know, was in one room for 35 years. And, and this is a man who was at the forefront of India's freedom struggle, you know, before even Gandhi came into picture. So he so it, it was not like a saint from day zero. But uh, so many such people, like even Vinoba, he walked, you know, this whole Bhutan, you know, movement across the country, 4 million acres of land donated. After doing all that, last 14 years of his life, he spends in one room. And, uh, and, and many such people, and, and, you know, when they say that, you know, it is really your own uh, civilization that you can offer as the highest service to humanity. I always, you know, used to, you know, have this thing. And uh, I think now it has it has come more clear that no matter where you are, like for me, it's just been a year that I've been in Oroville. Uh, but I think no matter where we are, uh, and which is where again, the work of, you know, right livelihood that whatever the work may be, you know, if that work is taking you to few steps closer to realizing who you are, you know, that self knowledge close to divine, whatever may be, you know, the terms we may use because, you know, uh, these are just, you know, play of words. Uh, then that is is the service you are doing, and which is where those examples, you know, like a diamond trader, you know, Srimad Rajendra was Gandhi's spiritual teacher. He was doing a diamond business, and Swamik shared the story of a butcher, you know, a noble butcher. So, uh, so you know, uh, in a traditional lens, you know, we can think of it as right livelihood, wrong livelihood. But in that moment, whatever may be, you know, uh, my work in whichever corner of the world I may be in. Uh, but if that work is taking me closer to realizing who I am uh, and my own, you know, self knowledge, then that is, you know, two steps closer. And in Oroville, we often talk about, you know, this whole thing of individual yoga and collective yoga. And uh, from what I understand about it, uh, is that for a fair kind of, you know, uh, in in the spiritual progress, for a fair bit, it is actually individual practice because uh, you really can't change others so it is only through your own you know self-work you know individual practices do you kind of you know affect others but then comes a certain stage when really you know there is this thing of group soul and collective soul then uh, you know, like you know Gandhi says that uh, before this whole India freedom you know movement happened there was some I think 70 or people leading it 
it was actually 25 years that they spent in the gandhi ashram together you know living together doing their you know personal work is what prepared them to create this you know movement at a, at a collective so uh, so i think uh, there is uh, there is this thing of collective because unless i have purified myself or you know i have kind of done enough cultivation work at an individual level uh, i don't think i can participate at the collective yoga level so yes at the material level we are all interconnected and we support each other but in yogic terms he speaks about a lot that has an individual has to do first and then it is a collective yoga so it's a, it's an ongoing uh, inquiry and a, and a journey for me uh, okay. what i understand as of now yeah Great, thanks. Pella, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Such a rich conversation. Um, thank you, Devin. And I think Bash also had a question. Yeah. So, Devin, thank you. So, my question is um, Has there been a time in the past one year in RV that you felt like this was the wrong decision to have been made? That's one question. So the other question is, um, when do you hope to leave Harville? And what do you think life is going to look like when you're out? So, uh, thanks. I think, uh, thankfully, uh, I don't think that there has been any point in the last one year where I felt that uh, coming to Harville was the wrong decision. So I think things have, worked out very beautifully for all three of us yes there were some you know points where i felt that this work is not what i need to get into right now in Aurovel and i should do something else so those kind of uh, things have happened where i realized that i don't want to get into any work which is at a systemic change because there is a 50 year history in Aurovel's the way systems are and for me to come and try to start changing systems was not something I tried to, I was invited to participate in some of that work and then I figured that no, this is not I should get into. So at that level, there have been some, you know, things where I felt that not this, but something else. But overall, I feel very privileged to be here and to be part of this work. So there has been no moment to uh, say that, uh, you know, it was a wrong decision. The answer to question of how long I will be here, I don't know. I am here with a, with a no set you know, timeline at the same time, no attachment also, you know, a year back, I didn't know I was here a year later. If uh, I'm meant to be somewhere else, I'm open also. If I'm meant to be here the rest of my life, I'm open also. So that's, that's the kind of uh, timeline I've come here with. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your, answers your question. <laughs> 